When most objects heat up, they expand. You can solve for the change in length of the object using this formula. Delta L refers to the extra length created. L0 refers to the initial length. Alpha refers to the coefficient of thermal expansion for that material, and delta T refers to the change in temperature. Note that you can use Celsius or Kelvin here since this is a change in temperature. If the object was two-dimensional, it would expand in all directions by the same proportion. Even holes in the object would expand. Thermal conductivity refers to the rate at which heat flows through a substance. It's proportional to K, the coefficient of thermal conduction for that material. It's also proportional to A, the surface area of the material and the difference in temperature between one side and the other, but it's inversely proportional to the thickness. It's measured in joules per second, which is just watts. Thermal conduction is one way to transfer heat, the other ways are radiation and convection. The ideal gas law is either given by PV equals little nRT or PV equals big N KT. Little n refers to the number of moles of the gas and R is the gas constant, 8.31. Big N refers to the number of molecules, and K refers to Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd. You can convert from moles to molecules using Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole. When heat is transferred between two objects, you can use the formula Q gained equals Q lost. When the object changes in temperature, you can use Q equals MC delta T, and when the object changes phase, you can use Q equals ML. Little c is the specific heat of the material. It tells you how many joules of heat you have to add to one kilogram worth of the material to raise its temperature by one degree Celsius. Big L is called the latent heat. Use the latent heat of fusion if the object's turning from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. Use the latent heat of vaporization if the object's turning from liquid to gas or gas to liquid. It's measured in joules per kilogram because it tells you how many joules you have to add to a kilogram's worth of the substance to change its phase. If ice at negative 30 degrees Celsius turns into water at 0 degrees Celsius, which turns into water at 50 degrees Celsius, you could figure out how much heat it would take to accomplish this whole process. First you have to raise ice to the melting point, which is 0 degrees Celsius. Then you have to melt all of the ice into water. Then you have to raise the temperature of the water to 50 degrees Celsius. This would be the total amount of heat gained by the ice. If the ice gained its heat from a steel sphere initially at 130 degrees Celsius sitting on top of the ice cube, you could determine how much heat was lost by the steel. The steel goes from 130 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. We've exchanged T initial and T final to avoid the negative sign. Overall, the total heat gained by the ice has to equal the total heat lost by the steel. The root mean square speed of a gas molecule gives you an idea of the average speed of the gas molecules. K refers to Boltzmann's constant. T is the temperature and it has to be measured in Kelvin since this is not a change in temperature. M is the mass of a single gas molecule and it has to be measured in kilograms. The mass of a gas molecule is approximately equal to the number of protons plus neutrons multiplied by 1 AMU, the atomic mass unit. That's because the atomic mass unit is the approximate mass in kilograms of one proton or one neutron. Another way to find the mass of a molecule is to take the molar mass and multiply by 1 AMU. The molar mass is defined to be the number of grams per mole of that substance. Even though molar mass is measured in grams per mole, when you multiply it by the atomic mass unit, you get the mass of the molecule in kilograms. Don't forget that most gases have two atoms per molecule. If a gas has only one atom per molecule, we call it monatomic, like helium, neon, or any of the noble gases. You can find the average kinetic energy of one of the gas molecules by using 1 half mv squared and substituting in vrms, which gives you 3 halves kt. There's actually four laws of thermodynamics if you include the zeroth law. If two objects are in thermal equilibrium, it means that they've sat together long enough that there's no longer any net heat exchanged between them. The zeroth law says that if object 1 is in thermal equilibrium with object 2, and object 2 is in thermal equilibrium with object 3, then object 1 has to also be in thermal equilibrium with object 3. It's really just a definition of temperature. Temperature is the quantity that will be the same between two objects when they are in thermal equilibrium. The first law of thermodynamics is really a statement of conservation of energy for a gas and a piston. U refers to the internal energy of the gas molecules, which is proportional to the temperature and is proportional to P times V. Q refers to the heat that flows into the gas, for example a fire underneath the piston. W refers to the work done on the gas by pushing down on the piston. 
If you push down on the piston, causing the volume of the gas to get smaller, you're doing positive work on the gas. If the gas expands, making the volume larger, then the work done on the gas is negative. If heat flows into a gas, then the Q is positive, and if heat flows out of a gas, like you've placed it in a sink full of ice, then the Q is going to be negative. Delta U will be positive if the internal energy U goes up. The internal energy will go up if the temperature goes up. The internal energy will go up if P times V goes up. On a PV diagram, any process can happen, but there are four common thermal processes that are talked about most often. One is called isothermal. In this process, the temperature is constant. In other words, the change in internal energy is zero. Another one's called adiabatic. In this process, no heat is transferred into or out of the gas, so Q is zero. During an isovolumetric process, the volume of the gas is constant, so no work is done on the gas, and W is zero. During an isobaric process, the pressure is constant, and you can easily find the absolute value of the work done by taking P times delta V. You can use this formula because the absolute value of the work done by any process equals the area underneath that process. Be careful with the signs though, regardless of the shape of the path, if the path moves to the right, the work done is negative because the gas is expanding. Similarly, if the process is taking a path to the left, then the gas is being compressed and positive work is done on the gas. Delta U will be positive if the temperature increases. The temperature will increase if P times V increases. In other words, the internal energy of the gas will go up if P times V goes up. Similarly, delta U will be negative if T goes down or if P times V goes down. If you take several different paths from the same initial and final point, the delta U will be the same for each one because it only depends on the initial and final points. Also, if the path makes a complete loop back onto itself, then the delta U has to be zero since it starts and ends at the same temperature. If the gas happens to be monatomic, you can use the formula delta U equals 3 halves NR delta T, or 3 halves NK delta T. But the most practical version of this equation is the formula 3 halves delta P times V, where delta PV refers to P final V final minus P initial V initial. But you can only use these formulas if it's a monatomic gas like helium. There isn't really a formula for Q, the heat. The way you find Q is by using the first law, delta U equals Q plus W and solving for Q. For a closed process in a PV diagram, remember that the total work is given by the area inside of the process. The sign of the total work done can be determined by the direction of the topmost path. Since the direction of this topmost path is leftward, the gas is being compressed and the work done is positive. The area inside of the closed process is only giving you the total work done. If you wanted the work done during any one of the processes, you can find the area underneath that process all the way down to the volume axis. The second law of thermodynamics says that the total entropy of the universe is always increasing because of irreversible processes. Since entropy is a measure of disorder, this means the total disorder of the universe is always increasing. This does not mean that the entropy of an object cannot go down. If you put water into a freezer, it becomes ice, which is a more ordered state, so the entropy of the ice went down. This can only happen because the freezer gives off heat, which increases the entropy of everything else by even more, which causes the total entropy to go up. If the temperature of an object is constant, you can find the change in entropy of that object by figuring out how much heat flows into the object divided by the temperature of the object. The heat that flows in at constant temperature is going to cause the entropy to go up, and the heat that flows out at constant temperature is going to cause the entropy to go down. Another way to state the second law is that no heat engine can have 100% efficiency at turning heat into work. Say you burn some coal, causing a total amount of heat QH to be released. This heat can spin a turbine, causing useful work to be done. But some of that heat's just going to get wasted into the environment. We call that QC or Q lost. The efficiency is defined to be the work done divided by the total energy that flows in. In other words, QH or Q total. If your engine efficiency was 1, it would mean that all the incoming energy is turned directly into useful work with no wasted heat. The second law says that this cannot happen. It's also useful to remember that since energy is conserved, the total heat that flows in has to equal the work done plus the heat that's lost. If you divide all these terms by time, you get a relationship amongst the powers. In other words, efficiency is equal to the power of the useful work you get out divided by the total power you're putting in. It turns out the most efficient heat engine you can make is called a Carnot engine. For a Carnot engine, the efficiency only depends on the temperature of the region where the heat is getting wasted compared to the temperature of the region where the heat is coming from. The efficiency of a Carnot engine is given by 1 minus Tc over Th. 